info. A Navajo cop from Cajun country. Go inside. Faces a violent suspect. Get on your stomach. A vicious assault at a national landmark. He came at me a second time, and I said, stay back, I'll use this. And across the reservation, Disney, you're my brother, man, wait! Families are in a fighting mood. Ah! His own brother stabbed him in the heart. Ah! 70,000 square kilometers of the Wild West. Spread out across three states. This is the largest Indian reservation in North America. And these are the Navajo cops. <laughs> Officers Wendell Bitsilli and Marwin Joe respond to a family fight in a remote area of the Navajo Nation. We'll go to Klagato. Two guys keep arguing and fighting, and just based on dispatches filed, they're saying that the guy may be on a warrant. The suspects are two brothers named Ronald and Roland. They have reportedly been arguing for several hours. We have dealt with these guys before, and these guys are always trouble. Right away, we started hearing yelling. Voices inside there. Looks like the reporting party is driving up, hopefully. So luckily, the mother came back. Um, she pretty much just pushed the door open, and it opened, we went right in. Right away, we came across uh, Ronald. Right away, Ronald was yelling, screaming. Uh, yo! Oh, no, no, no. We don't have time for this, guys. We don't have time for this. He started swinging. No, no. Stop resisting. So we pinned him on the couch and we put him on the ground, cuffed him. Get on your feet. Get on your feet. Get out! Easy. Officer Joe already has one prisoner on board from another arrest. You're my brother, man. Wait. Man, you guys got no right to do this. Wait, wait, wait. The guy in the white t-shirt, he's kind of stirring up the fire there. Hey, mister. This guy's got no right to do that to you, dude. Huh. To put up. Wait, 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 wait. Don't bust my arm, all right? You don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Mr. Easy, sit up. Who you for? So that one's Ronald. This one's Roland. Roland, can you walk? Come on. Okay, thank you. Walk around the front. Come on, don't get stupid, man. I know. Right in there. Then he started trying to hit butt Officer Joe, so I went in and drive some with the taser. Get in! Get in! Get in! Get in! Get in. Get in. You, get over! Get over! Get over! Hurry up! Get in! You're done playing! Get in! Get in. Left foot first! Get in! Try. Try. You're standing there. Get in. And he started kicking at me, so he went for two cycles at that time. Don't be kicking at me, man. Don't be kicking at me. You done? And I think that finally got his attention. Are you done? <laughs> Kick again, man. Kick again. I'm done. Sit up right like a man. Come on. Sit up right. With the officer using the taser on the guy, the bottom line is we're going to be going home, and we didn't get hurt. These guys are always fighting. Our backup is usually an hour away, and the two guys were not complying with our verbal command. One of the guys kicked Wendell, and the other one almost hit butted me. So Wendell had to stun one of them. This is not the way of our, our culture, and they shouldn't be fighting among each other. We're supposed to take care of our families out here. So tonight, these two are going to be spending the night in jail. Ronald, he's on the warrant. The mother confirmed the date of birth that it was given by dispatch. And then the other one's just going to be for criminal nuisance. 240 kilometers north, a small team of officers goes on duty in the Kayenta Police District. 
a massive 6,600 square kilometer area that covers vast portions of Arizona and Utah. I was perishing. Any weapons on you, Elvis? Zoo. No. What happened? What's going on? Their beat includes Monument Valley. Immortalized in John Wayne Westerns, Monument Valley attracts 400,000 tourists from around the world each year. But for the men and women of the Kayenta district, this scenic terrain carries its share of bad memories. More officers have been killed in Kayenta than in any other part of the reservation. This area, two of our officers were killed. They were ambushed and they were murdered out here. Took them out way out there towards the river. They were handcuffed in the back and they they, uh, they, lit, they lit the unit on fire with, while they were still in, while they were still inside the unit. For Officer Virgil Smith, today's shift isn't starting out easy. We're headed to Monument Valley. It's our first traffic for my shift right now. Possibly a tour bus driver was pepper sprayed at the view in Monument Valley, Utah. We don't know who the suspect is or why he was pepper sprayed and right now. They're saying that he has difficult breathing. We'll see what's going on when we get there. As Smith races north towards the Utah border, more details come in over the radio. Right now, we just got a call from the dispatcher that uh, they're saying that um, the guy that was pepper sprayed is not breathing at this time. They're advising that there's nobody doing CPR at this time. 633, can't tell me 1097. Okay, we're approaching the incident scene. We're going to go find out where the incident is. Luckily, the victim in the pepper spray attack, a tour bus driver, is now conscious and talking. Sir, can you explain to me what happened? <laughs> I, he blocked the bus and he hit the door of the bus and I walked up to tell him, you can't, you can't hit the door of the bus to, to make me stop. And then he just pulled out the mace and sprayed me in the face. Uh-huh. I, he blocked Apparently, the attack stemmed from an earlier incident on the road leading into Monument Valley. A tourist was driving slowly in front of the tour bus taking photos. As the bus pulled around to pass him, the suspect allegedly flashed an obscene gesture. Later, in the visitor center parking lot, the suspect boxed in the bus with his vehicle, leading to the incident. So, he got me right in the face, straight was, right was he face. driving, was he riding in the same bus you were driving? No, he's driving a van with a, a trailer in Kansas plates. Okay. <laughs> and I want to press charges. Okay. So when they came up here, this guy just came out the pepper spray and sprayed him right in the face. So the bus driver wants to file assault charges on him right now. Smith's supervisor, Sergeant Philip Claw, arrives on the scene. Fair to Huh? Not for use on humans. This is two deter bears from attacking humans. The suspect claims that he was assaulted first. Uh, no, I hadn't read it that close. I'm sorry. No. Had I felt had I felt threatened, I wouldn't have used it. Well, you I, I, I should have read the instructions on this. It says not to be used on humans. It says two to tear pairs from attacking humans. Bear mace is similar to pepper spray, but most canisters have greater reach and knockdown power, enough to subdue a thousand pound grizzly. But on some human victims, it could be fatal. So you know what you did is wrong, right? I felt very threatened, sir. How was that? He hit me. He, he, hit he, he, he assaulted me, sir. He hit me in the chest and he knocked my phone and pen out of my hand. I went down to pick it up. He came at me a second time. I pulled it out and I said, stay back, I'll use this. I've got combat injuries, sir. I can't risk getting hurt. If I get As Sergeant Claw continues to question the suspect, 
Virgil interviews the tour guide whose driver was attacked. Maybe I'm a bear. My, my driver is a bear too. What, what is he doing with bear spraying here? Uh, basically, he's saying that the bus driver is the one that came out and attacked him. What's gonna happen with this guy? I mean, the driver, the one guy who sprayed. Well, right now we're trying to get that process. It's like this, we're Navajo tribal police officers. We can't really arrest non-natives right now. Yeah. But all we can do is get the document and refer it to Navajo County, and uh -huh. then they can take it from there and actually file charges from there. Because the suspect isn't a Navajo, Smith turns him over to an officer from the Arizona Highway Patrol. He doesn't go ahead and take the report again. And then from there, he's going to go ahead and decide to release him and probably refer him to Navajo County. Although he's not going to jail today, the suspect could be facing misdemeanor assault charges that carry a maximum sentence of up to one year in jail. Like many Navajos in this area, Officer Smith still maintains a close connection to family traditions. Come on, dog. The sheep, they're coming back now. The sheep and goat, they're a big herd that my grandma has. As you can see, it's my little brother, cousin brothers. They're the ones that are, I guess, watching the sheep all day, herding sheep. This is like back when, when I was their age, that's what we used to do. We didn't have ATV back then. We, we had to use these horses here. Uh, we had to saddle them up and actually go after the sheep with these horses. So now it's these guys' turn, you know, they, they do what, what we did. He's one amazing man. He takes care of us from when the sun comes up to when the sun goes down. There's no other man like him. I can depend on him. He makes everybody laugh, no matter what mood somebody's in. You'll make somebody laugh. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Back on the road, Smith catches another call from dispatch. We're going to Chill Chimbito. I guess the guy got out of hand, and they tied him up right now. And there's another call not too far from that same location. There's several um, individuals that are fighting at that location. So we've got two things going on at one time at that small community. Oh, there he is, tied up. What's going on? You did? Yeah. Out of control. You got out of control? Yeah, but there he's drunk. OK. He was saying he was going to go get his gun and shoot us. How long ago did it happen? about an hour and a half ago. Oh, what happened? And he messed up my house. With the man in custody, Officer Virgil Smith now has to deal with another fight in this village of just over a 1,000 people. OK, we're going to the next call that we had earlier, where there's several individuals that are fighting. So we'll see what happens when we get there. 12 kilometers south, another officer, Jason White, has already arrived at the scene of the second fight. What's going on there? Were you over there? Yeah, they got to fight. OK. They whipped my ass. I'm coming home. This is my house. Mm -hmm. What happened to your hand? They want to fight with knives. Knives? What's your name? Johnny. Johnny? OK, come on over here, Johnny. You want to arrest me? Yeah. Can I take here. me in? Yes, I am. So who's all over there? Here. Somebody was fighting here. There's a bunch of blood out here. Yeah. Yeah. Not it. Not you? Let me see your hands real quick. So what happened to your fist? The man claims he tried to break up the fight and confirms that Johnny was involved. 
He also tells Officer White that another suspect named Clarence has been badly beaten and is hiding in a nearby traditional dwelling known as a hogan. All right, let me go check on the other guy and see if he's okay. okay. All right. Clarence, Neville, please. Can I come in? Can I come in real quick? Take a look at you, make sure you're okay? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else in the house? Nobody. Nobody? From his injuries, it's clear that Clarence has been in a fight. <laughs> While Officer White deals with Clarence, Smith questions the man he found hogtied by his family. It turns out that what the officers thought were two separate incidents are connected. OK. Well, apparently, this guy that we just arrested earlier, I guess he came over earlier. The fight broke loose, and I guess that's where he, he got himself into a fight. He does have swollen jaw and whatnot, so I did call the ambulance out for him so they can check him and see if he's OK. But he's saying that he doesn't want no medical attention, but. Just for our, his safety, you know, we have to get that done. I'm just going to look very good, Clarence. Officers transport the other suspects to the holding cell at the Kayenta police station. 128 kilometers from Kayenta, Officer Perry Champagne starts his shift on the far western side of the reservation. Champagne is one of only five non-native officers with the tribal police department. He's a Cajun who moved to the Navajo Nation 20 years ago from Louisiana. They're good people. I came out here, I fell in love, not only with a lady, but with the lady's culture. Three, four, three. Champagne and his wife have recently separated, and within the past few weeks, he has also been diagnosed with a serious illness. I might have prostate cancer. So we're going through the testing, and it's a motivator. I think about it. I think about everything I've been through in a, a year and a half. And um, it's, it's hard, because I said I, uh, I've been on my own for a year and a half now. And in a year and a half, I have learned to be very humble. I am grateful, because I've had to start my life back over. Like I said, I'm not from here. I'm a native New Orleanian. And the only thing that, that tied me out here was a wife and kids. And I still have my kids. I still have me. I have my job. So right now, we're headed to a domestic in progress, um, just right here um, to our west. 34 Tibb, I'm 97. 34 Tibb. Champagne joins another Tuba City officer who's already on the scene. Well, we have a situation here with a young man named Brandon who I've dealt with before. Uh, Brandon has a, a history of substance abuse, drugs and alcohol. His sister wants him off the property and looks like he had been violent with the younger kids. Brandon, just Brandon. Enough. Brandon. Brandon, come Brandon. Brandon. I have all this shit. All right, okay. Let me take a breather. I just got off work. Let me tell you guys. I just got off work. Well, just go, do it back. outside. Do it My outside. My sister started bitch. I no, came in. Outside. I don't want you in here. Okay. Well, I got grabbed my Sister's throwing him off the property. She's fed up with him. So we're just standing by so he can remove his items off the property. Everything he has, see, he's taken. He's taken his clothes, his video games. He's even got a pop-up tent. Well, you have him. You had to go to your mom's house and go to nope. jail, Brandon. Boy, you had to take the job with all my Okay, let's go there. That's fine, we'll do that. Officer Tiffany Tallman arrives to assist with the arrest. Sometimes it's good for another officer to go in and, you know, talk to the victims. Sometimes there's um, things that they don't like to bring up when the suspect is right there. Yeah, take him 483 for me. All right, because he. 
He did um, push one of the boys inside. Yeah, which no, machines. No, I did not. Well, what we'll do, we'll go ahead and take him for disorderly conduct. I'm not going to charge you with battery. Dude, I did not push no one. Well, you're not, you're not going to jail for pushing anybody. You're going to jail for being disorderly. No, I, I got to go to work. And well, look, I well, have... You, you get out. If you you no. let him book you now, you get out before what 8 a.m. Dude, I'm yeah. serious. I just he he wouldn't him. stop. He, he was... He was told just to um, just leave, leave in peace. But he uh, agitated the situation. The sister didn't want him there and was disorderly. So Officer Champagne, Officer Champagne did arrest him. So he's going to jail. Officer Tallman transports the suspect to the Tuba City Jail. What? Unlike the full-size correctional facility in Window Rock, the Tuba City Jail is little more than three trailers and a booking desk. Regardless of their offense, few suspects spend more than eight hours here before being released. Brandon. Hold on, I have all this in my hand. Brandon. Look. I see that. Yes, I know, okay. Tiff. I'm not trying okay. to fight you or nothing. Let me help you. Let me help you. Harry, grab him. Tuba City is a small community. I grew up here, and a lot of people know each other, so I do deal with a lot of the people that I grew up with. What do you guys do with all my stuff? Oh, I'll log it in for you. Why are you guys? I gotta be at work in the morning. Brandon! You gotta shut the up! Yeah, calm down! Brandon, you need to calm down, okay? Calm yourself. Get on his stomach. Ready? Get on his stomach, Brandon. Get on his stomach. Give me your arm! Give me your arm, Brandon. Give me your arm. What's wrong with you? Put your hands behind your back. Quick kicking. Quick oh, kicking. Don't hit me. Don't hit me. Give me your arm. Do you hear me? Yes. Give me your arm. Stop. It's not here. Stop. We're being cruel with you. Get off. Stop, Brandon. Okay, son? Stop. Stop. No need for you to be that way. Come on now. No need. Ridiculous. Damn, you're ridiculous, Tim. Brandon, enough. Okay? I said please to you earlier. I'm just mad because what my sister said. Well, you know what? Don't stick it out on us. Yeah, we didn't do it. How long am I to be in this place? Eight, Eight hours. hours. Well, am I going to be out in the morning to go to work? Yes, and sit, sit up. Sit up. Sit up. You guys are a me, man. That was a little adrenaline rush, but they do that sometimes. Well, they do that a lot. <laughs> but um, he's in jail. He's going to have to sleep it off, and he'll be out in eight hours. Have a seat. On your knees. He's on something. I think it's more than alcohol. Because I know the kid, and he's, um, when he's sober, even when he's drunk, he's, um, he's not so belligerent. He's actually a, a good, a good person. It's amazing. It's like, um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It really is. You take some of these young people, and they're like the nicest people in the world, and they get chemicals, the wrong chemicals in the bloodstream. One hundred ninety kilometers north, Navajo Fish and Wildlife Officer Eddie Benali prepares for a three-day patrol with agents from the Bureau of Land Management. I guess we'll head on the way. Work to get right. Today we're on the San Juan River. We're going to check on bighorn sheep. Uh, it's one of the patrols I do when I'm in this area. I'll try to get down here as much as I can. They've reported dogs coming down here, and they're definitely chasing sheep, so we need to keep those uh, stray dogs out. On the south side of the river is the Navajo Nation, and on the river right is the BLM. We work together all the time. Rick is the river ranger, and Marie is the law enforcement with BLM. The river is also the home of dozens of ancient Anasazi ruins and hundreds of thousand-year-old petroglyphs. 
the officers are also investigating vandalism and theft in the sacred sites. We're going to check some places that we have concerns of, some of the petroglyphs. We have some vandalism already, so we'd like to keep an eye on let people know that we're all down here. Here's, we call it desecration panel. It's all this uh, rock art has literally been destroyed. Some of these right here, these uh, pecs here, that, that, these are new. They just, somebody's come and chipped yeah. on it. You can see that in areas like this, how that rock has patinaed, even though it was chipped, it now has absorbed the colors that are flowing down over it, it versus where you have something that's fresher and the colors have not been absorbed. So you can pick out an old graffiti from a more recent graffiti that way. They see something neat, I've never seen that before, and they just chip on it, but then I don't think it's adding art for the next generation. I mean, the best thing they can do is just leave it alone. Just as devastating as the destruction of rock art is the plundering of ancient ruins. Illegal digs have plagued the Navajo Nation for more than a century as the price of ancient pottery has skyrocketed. Benali finds fresh vehicle tracks in the sand, evidence that someone might be in the area. Yeah, I, I just watch. I mean, the best thing is I have is time. I just look, see what's any movement, hear anything, uh, maybe hear the engine motor of a vehicle. You can stand still and listen for a while. That's the best thing about here is it's, it's so quiet. I'm standing here just looking up that way, stay for just for a few minutes. Somebody may be up there, and I don't want to go up and get surprised by somebody else who's up there. Stealing from these ruins is a federal crime, but it doesn't stop most well-armed thieves. Many looters are what are known as twiggers, Southwestern slang for meth addicts hired to dig at archaeological sites. They got nothing to lose, so they're out there all night and they're high on meth and they make good diggers. They're out there all through the night digging it. Maybe carrying a gun, packing a gun. They don't want to be caught. The officers have been in a situation where they have been in shootouts. Even taking a simple piece of ancient pottery off the ground is a federal crime. People think of surface collecting as not being as serious as digging, and in a lot of ways, it's even more serious because they take away the history. They literally steal the history away. Being in Navajo, traditionally, you're not supposed to go into these. These are grave sites. You can't walk on it. You can't pick up pottery shards. You can't pick up pots. It's just taboo. I've been in law enforcement for a long time, and it's part of my job. There's just a lot of things that you're not supposed to do traditionally. It's what we do. Fortunately, the only signs that humans have been here are 600-year-old corn cobs, the only graffiti, Anasazi rock art. So far, it looks pretty clean. I haven't seen anything yet. Actually, it looks pretty good. Have some dinner and uh, look at stars and start again tomorrow. Another new day. Back in Kayenta, Arizona, Officer Virgil Smith responds to a call to back up a fellow officer. The other officer just got a report of a break in the entry at one of the local school housings. So we're going to go see what he has. We're going to go ahead and go that direction right now. This weekend, many locals in the Kayenta area have left town for a tribal fair in Shiprock, New Mexico. As a result, the officers are on the lookout for suspects who use this as an opportunity to steal from their neighbors. The guy with the black leather jacket, camouflage pants. Where is his location at? Right before you get to the new story house, go around back up on the Smith joins Officer Jason White at the scene. He's still in the back. The officers corner the suspect in the victim's yard. 
Officer White quickly takes a man with a native flute into custody. You can buy this for like about almost $150. I don't know if this individual bought it himself, but she'll see. And what's your name, sir? Dean. Yeah. Last name? As Officer White looks for more evidence of the break-in, Smith questions the suspect and searches him for stolen property. OK, who'd you say that lives here? Your window. I did try. This week? Yeah. Smith finds a small bag of marijuana and rolling papers in the man's pockets. They say he had um, marijuana in his um, left pocket. That's where I took it out from, so I'm going to be charged with um, possession of marijuana. OK, and where's she at? Oh, she probably. How do you know her? I know her because she's my girlfriend. She's your girlfriend? Yeah. OK. So do you have access into the house right now? No, I'm just chilling out, man. Just you know. Okay. So where'd you get that marijuana from? From her. From her? With the suspect loaded for transport to jail, Smith and White check the house's windows and doors for signs that the man tried to force his way in. To that door. Well, well if this is his girlfriend, I want to know why he would take the screen off and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. Let me go book him in. Then I'll okay. see if I can get more information off him, too. All right. Let's see if I can get a. Because the owner of the house is in Shiprock, the officers are unable to determine if the suspect's story is true or if the flute has actually been stolen. For now, the officers will take him to the Kayenta police station for booking. As night falls across the Navajo Nation, Officers Virgil Smith and Vernon Nelson team up to make an arrest at a fight disturbance outside of Kayanta, Arizona. Right now, they are the only two officers on duty in this 6,600 square kilometer region. What happened, Virgil? They just started fighting on the porch. Both of them? Yeah, them both too? of them, yeah. She said it was both of them Tino, um, Peaches, and the yellow horse. Blood on the curtain. Yeah. Um, I think um, he has a small cut on the finger. As Smith transports the prisoners back to town, Nelson is called to deal with another dispute. The caller is a mother of two boys who has a long history of trouble with her husband's family. Seven years ago, her husband was killed by one of his brothers in a fight. Officer Nelson was first on the scene that night. Her husband? His, his own brother stabbed him in the heart with a knife. He had a knife still stuck in his chest, protruding about maybe half an inch. I couldn't do no CPR because the knife was still stuck in his chest. And it was my case, and it went federal to his brother, sir. And now, according to, to the mother here, that he's out. 631, Captain. 24. Be 97. Hi, Latoya? Yeah. How are you doing? Good. Can I come in? Yeah, come on. I was told that you want to pick up your kids today. Yeah. They didn't want to be around the guy that killed her. Yeah. But right now, it's actually another of her husband's brothers she's worried about. This is what's going on. My boys, they stay up there, off and on, on weekends and whatnot. Then it got to the point where they were keeping them from me. My oldest, he told him, he goes, Mom, I want to come home. He goes, my uncle attacked me. They didn't want to be around him because that's the guy that killed her dad. Yeah. But now the other uncle's telling them, oh, well, you're just going to end up like your dad. I got um, a protection order Okay. for the uncle to stay away from them. I wouldn't keep my kids there. She filed a protection order um, today, and the, the judge granted it for her. So we've got the court papers here. We're going to serve to the defendant. The family might might resist. Where we're going right now is where it happened. These kids, they're being mistreated. I don't know why she's been taking them over there in the first place. I guess it's family, they want the kids to visit to them, but trying to keep keep them away and take them away from her. Vernon follows the mother to her husband's family home site. Hopefully, he can serve the papers and recover the children without encountering the man he helped send to prison. 
I'm here to serve some court papers to Mary and Erwin. Are they, are they, are they home? Erwin. Yeah, can you step out here for a minute? Uh, maybe three. It says sprinkling. Well, can I step inside then? Oh, OK, Erwin. This is a protection order that's been filed by Latoya. You know her? Her kids? Yeah, her kids. Yeah. Are they here? Yeah. Well, they're... Yeah, they're gonna... She wants to pick them up also. No, I'm not signing it. They're not going in there. Well, sir, this, this is a court order, OK? They, she has... She is, she is going to take the kids. This happened Look, everyone, this you want to get... You want to get arrested now? <laughs> this is a court order, OK? That court order is... I'm pretty sure you don't want to get arrested now, Erwin, for interfering with the court order. Yeah, but... It's a court order. Inside the house, the uncle tries to stand in the way of Nelson and the two young boys. It's a, kids now. It's a court order. I'm trying to understand that part. You guys have to go back with your mom. Your natural mom, that's your mom. It'll be all right. I mean, you guys are still family. You're not going with your mom. You can't go. Your mom's wrote something in that paper that's Understand this. If he interferes, he could get in trouble. See? I don't care if I go to jail, you know. I'll get out the next day. These guys is my brother's kids, and I look at them as my own sons, you know? You can't stand in front of him and say he can't go. Yeah, he has the right to go with his mom. Everything else supersedes that. His being with his mom supersedes everything that you've done. You want to go, go. Don't come back again, because I'm not going to play this Come on, let's go. Finally, Nelson succeeds in getting the boys out of the house. Outside, the man continues to harass their mother. Don't come here and say nothing today about this I just already talked to these two about it. All I'm doing is... My son comes to me crying, I'm gonna believe He him. always cries, that's his thing. Like today, he f again, trying to lie. All right, Toya, go ahead and go. All right, get the f out of here now. Go. Oh, we're going. Get going then. He was really protective, like he was a father. He was actually standing in the kids' way, but he didn't care. You know, he's like, take me to jail. I'll be out in the morning, I'll be back. I guess he's kind of harsh, being too aggressive towards the kids. The mother was saying that one of them, he threw down and he had his knee jammed into his neck. The two boys wanted to go. I think they were just afraid of him, that he was standing there, the way he was talking, the way he was being all belligerent. And I think the two boys really wanted to go. Nelson is satisfied that the children are safe, and he's happy not to have encountered the other uncle he helped send to prison seven years earlier. I think we're pretty much lucky that he wasn't there or else we'd have been had, a, I would have had a two, two problems I had to deal with. For Navajo cops, family fights and domestic violence calls like this one present the ultimate risk. Only four months earlier, veteran Sergeant Daryl Curley was killed while responding to a domestic dispute. It was a call of uh, two brothers arguing outside at that time. They said, you know, this got them in handcuffs, they're escorting them out. And by the time I got to my post, 316, 317, Porter, that's when they told us that the you know, shots fired. That's one of the most dangerous calls we, you know, as law enforcement officers do respond to because we don't know the full extent of what's going on. The aggressor does have access to various types of weapons. Once we enter, we're at their mercy. I'm gonna be 10 6 east of the three. As an Iraq War veteran and member of the Navajo PD's strategic reaction team, Philbert Toddy uses his free time on a private gun range to prepare for the life or death situations that come with the job. It all depends on my work schedule as well as, you know, schedule from being you know, a parent. It's also a good stress reliever as well. Where it all comes down to, you know, pre preparation from unsnapping the holster, extracting the gun, everything does play a role in it. This isn't regulation target practice. 
Toddy uses his own ammunition to fine tune the skills that will keep him alive. That's why we have to constantly train and remain vigilant each time we respond to these calls because, you know, in an instant, it could change from being subtle to being, you know, a life or death situation. Tonight, Filbert Toddy is backing up his fellow Window Rock officers on night patrol. Even though his shift ended at 2 p.m., he's helping out big brother, Erwin Toddy. Dispatch sends numerous reports of public intoxication on the highway. With temperatures below freezing, a night in jail could mean the difference between life and death. Come on, let's go. Oh. So double check on him, make sure he's okay. If you get him out of this cold so we don't have another victim of exposure. Even though it's a desert climate, we still get snow, we still get rain. We still get cold air coming from the mountains. All right, come on. Set up, partner. You know, it's a bad thing because, you know, you kind of think about the family as well, you know. Someone's father, someone's husband, oh. someone's brother, someone's child, you know. Then, at 8 p.m., the Toddy brothers get an urgent call to respond to a home site in the mountains west of Fort Defiance. A domestic dispute that has spiraled out of control. A known gangbanger, this like law enforcement, who was involved in an incident New Year's regarding the homicide. One of and this is, uh, Navajo cops Irwin and Filbert Toddy respond to a family quarrel at a rural home site. The officers aren't sure if this is the same suspect police questioned in a recent unsolved murder. I was there. A force had to be used on him to take him to custody. The Toddy brothers join other officers in Blue Canyon. Erwin Toddy meets a man who is trying to help the family locate the suspect who fled the scene. I want your family, so the family called me up, so that's why I rushed up here and helped out. OK, who's the one that's disturbing? Uh, Bryson. Bryson? Yeah. I just came up here. According to witnesses, the man they're looking for is the stepson of the recent murder victim. An alleged gang member was found shot to death two weeks earlier in a valley east of Fort Defiance. I've had brothers with him before, and some of his friends uh, were uh, associated with, with gangs, the local gangs here in Fort Defiance. Me and Officer Garcia, we responded to a person that was um, laying in the middle. We saw the person face down. And based on our examination, what the wounds were, how it was placed, we determined this was a homicide. It's one of the things you just can't forget. The toddies split up to search for Bryson in the dense brush. His cell phone chimed off right down the way here. I'm a blade, see your hands. Get your hands up. Mom! Mom! Check it out. I just want to see my mom! No. I didn't even do nothing. I just want to see my big brother off. Please, he's up there. It's a statement from that incident over the New Year's the homicide. You can say he's very distraught. Once again, I'm drinking. So push him over the edge here. It turns out Bryson was trying to get to his stepfather's burial site. A lot of traditional families like to have a rural burial site like out part of their homeland area, and they'll bury him out there close to their home. And they have four days to do that. They get buried with any type of jewelry, saddles, saddle blankets. In tradition, you're not supposed to keep any stuff 
that the deceased had, but you just let it go with the person. Back in the old days, if he had a horse, they would actually put down the horse. It is pretty much taboo to actually keep going back to the same site. I just want to see my brother up there, Oz. That's all I want to see. He died on New Year's Eve. Please, sir, I just want to see you. That's all I want to see. He is the stepchild to the victim. But he does refer to him as his big brother in a way that signifies the bond that he established with him. Am I going to jail? Yes, you are. I'll go book him out Yeah, he's good out here. I'll be around to 105. Toddy drives to a transfer point where he meets up with another officer who will take the suspect to the Window Rock Jail. I want to advise you to do this. Remain strong, you understand? Yeah. All right. This kind of behavior is unacceptable, especially your own career. I'm not a family member, you're going to be in the right state of mind. All right? Yeah, yeah. It's hard. But still, you know, you have to maintain a little bit of discipline. This kid, he's going through so much right now. I understand how he's feeling. I know what death can do to a family, in particular, an individual as young as him. This is the human cost that we have to deal with with the gang activity in the Fort Defiance area, as well as throughout the Indian Reservation. This is a, the way it's supposed to be for Navajo people. Back in Window Rock, Brothers Filbert and Erwin Toddy blow off a little steam after a long night on patrol. Hey, G, my food? OK, uh, can I have a double cheeseburger, extra cheese, onions, a large milkshake, seasoned fries, and a strawberry parfait? OK, and also a side order of novel tacos with extra tomatoes and cheese. I'd like to have a senior discount added to it, too, also, please. We're federally commissioned, so we charge us federally discount. I really do love and respect my brother a lot. I enjoy working with him. We face a lot of dangers. We take a lot of calls together. Towards the end of the day, that's really rewarding when we come together, we joke around. That's the only way we blow off steam, you know, and carry on with the next call. 